Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. What is perhaps most interesting about the Slender Man legends is that it is very much a case of urban folklore with definite and documented origins, one that we have seen grow before our collective eyes. And in doing so, it has offered those who research or simply have an interest in such things as legends, myths, and folklore the opportunity to see such a legend grow and develop right in front of them and so perhaps offering how such legends and myths of ancient times grew and maintained their presence in the human psyche thousands of years later. And also why, despite in this case the solid, concrete, documented origins, some people still insist that they have had a genuine encounter with this mysterious figure. The legend very much crossed over into reality with the Waukesha incident, also referred to as the Slender Man Stabbing, in 2014 with the attempted murder of a young girl by two of her friends in order to appease the Slender Man. This should make us contemplate just what it takes for a myth to become reality and how much perception really does matter to that process. What is nothing but a fictional creation for most can become a cold reality to others and, consequently, while indirectly, to the rest of us. Indeed, the Slender Man legend is as unique as it is unsettling, and one that will undoubtedly continue to grow as the years and the decades go by. Just where the Slender Man and its position in the subconscious of humanity might be in hundreds of years is perhaps equally as fascinating. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, we'll look at the intriguing start to the Slender Man legend, how it evolved into not just one real-life murder but suicides as well we'll debate whether it's possible for an imaginary figure like Slender Man to become a reality, and we'll look at a possible connection between Slender Man and a real-life mystery in the 1830s. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Unlike many other myths, both ancient and contemporary, the origins of the Slender Man are very definite. They can be traced back to the exact date of June 10, 2009 and the internet forum Something Awful. It was on that forum that users were asked to create paranormal images that could be passed off as something real, unnerving, and most importantly, real. One user who took up the challenge would submit two photographs under the name Victor Serge, his real name Eric Knudsen, photographs which were indeed unsettling, largely because of the slow-burn nature with which most people first see them. What perhaps made Serge's submitted photographs stand out was the captions of text that he submitted with each of the pictures, which also succeeded in adding a further chilling backstory 
as well as giving his discreet but spine-chilling character a name. The first picture shows a group of children who are clearly disturbed and scared, while a tall, slim, dark figure is seen standing discreetly in the background. With the picture, Serge added the following text, "'We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time." 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. The second picture shows children playing in a park, much happier, but with the same unnerving figure standing in the background. In this picture, there is even the suggestion of tentacles stretching from the figure's back, but in a moment of genius on Serge's part, this is explained away in the captioned text as film defects, adding a sense of credibility and seriousness to the photographs, and the strange, menacing man. The caption for the picture reads, one of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanished and for is referred to as the Slender Man, deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986. Photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13, 1986. To say the pictures captured the attention of thousands would be an understatement. As soon as the pictures went online, the legend of the Slender Man was born, and he would take on a life of his own. Nudson drew inspiration from several well-known horror characters and writers and would state in a 2016 interview with Vanity Fair that he had wanted to create something whose motivations can barely be comprehended and which caused unease and terror in a general population. And as the Slender Man spread across the internet, not only had he achieved this, but the legend grew, and grew rapidly. His description is indeed one of an unnerving nature. Unusually tall and slim, with arms that are much longer and out of proportion to the rest of his body, with some descriptions stating the arms to be like tentacles, others state tentacles come from Slender Man's back. Perhaps most unsettling, however, is his face, or more to the point, the lack of it. Most depictions either have a blurred face with no discernible details or a completely blank, white face. Whether it's because they can be of a menacing and unsettling nature themselves, the Slender Man was often associated with the woods and dark forests. Even more disturbing, he is said to reside in abandoned locations such as houses, buildings, or even caves, which certainly sits well with other supernatural creatures, both fictional and alleged real entities. The Slender Man, according to the legends, can also transport himself from one location to another as he wishes. There have even been symptoms or signs agreed upon that the Slender Man is near or watching you. These include sudden paranoia, intense nightmares, apparent partial memories that suggest hallucinations, as well as the sudden onset of nosebleeds. What is perhaps interesting with these is that they are very similar to many of the discrete signs of alien abduction. And while we are not for one moment suggesting that the Slender Man, a completely fictional character, remember, is actually an alien, but what we might suggest is that some of the apparent claims of real encounters with the Slender Man might actually have been alien abduction, only recalled as encounters with the Slender Man, particularly in the young. Speculative, admittedly, but worth noting. The reasons for Slender Man's immediate popularity and how fast it spread around the internet to become an overnight urban legend are intriguing in themselves. The legend of the Slender Man, though, was about to step from the digital, virtual, and in this case imaginary world of the internet, and into the reality of the American public in a most chilling and disturbing way. Up next, Slender Man crosses over into cold, hard, and murderous reality when Weird Darkness Returns. <laughs> S- 
strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. On May 31, 2014, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, two 12-year-old girls, Anissa Weir and Morgan Geyser, led their mutual friend Peyton Leitner, also 12, to the woods nearby. Once there, they turned on her, stabbing her no less than 19 times before leaving her for dead. They'd been playing hide-and-seek in the moments before the attack. By the time it was over, Leitner would have injuries to her arms and legs as well as several wounds in her torso, two of which were two major organs and another narrowly missing a major heart artery. The victim managed to drag herself out of the woods and was eventually discovered on the roadside by a passing cyclist who immediately notified authorities. She would name her attackers, who were arrested a short time later at a nearby store, the knife they had used in the attack still in her possession. They would state that they had carried out the attack for the Slender Man, and while Weir did appear to feel guilt over her part in the frenzied assault, Geyser was seemingly unconcerned, she claimed that the Slender Man would be displeased with them if they had not carried it out. ABC News covered this case very well. Here is just some of the audio from those news reports. A birthday sleepover with three 12-year-olds the night before, and now two girls are missing. The other, Peyton Leitner, has somehow crawled out of the woods, covered in stab wounds. Nineteen of them. She is wheeled into the operating room. More than eight months after that moment, the pre-trial hearing. And we're now hearing from the detectives who tried to talk to her the moment she, she was brought was, in. Uh, it seemed that it, it hurt too much for her to talk. Um, she had a hard time breathing. Outside that hospital, in that town... A major search by ground. These and are the woods air. where the stabbing police action. are still on the scene the here. Frantic tonight. search for the two missing Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire. Two 12 year old girls stabbing their friend nearly to death is unimaginable any time, but especially for a safe community like the city of Waukesha. So unimaginable that even the brother of one of those missing girls at first confused, fearing for her safety too showing reporters photos of his sister, asking, have you seen her? That's her, that's Anissa. She's been missing for I don't know how long now. While back at the hospital, the surgeon, John Kellerman, is about to discover just how much damage has been done. The knife came directly down at this point where this large branch was coming off of this major artery and cut through the tissue overlying it so that the vessels were totally exposed by this injury. The knife cut through the tissue, but not the artery itself. Exactly. The knife stopped at the wall of the artery. And had it not? Had it not, she would have uh, had a major heart attack from the amount of bleeding and probably died within a minute or two. That close to death, but they were now saving her life. While the hunt for the other two girls is in high gear, every agency in the area searching. We had the Waukesha County Sheriff's Department, the City of Waukesha Police Department, New Berlin Police Department, City of Waukesha Fire Department, and Flight for Life, all scouring that area. Then, nearly five hours after Peyton crawled out of those woods, the two other girls are found. They were right here along Interstate 94, heading out of Waukesha. A knife with a five-inch blade found in one of the girls' bags. And just this week in court, we heard from the officer describing Anissa Wire the moment she was taken into custody. I asked her to show me her hands, and she complied. And then I asked her to walk towards my voice, 
I noticed there was some staining on her sweatshirt around the abdomen area. And Anissa, in her own words, describing the moment she was found. I said, I'm scared. I was told, I was told that if I didn't do something, my family would be in danger. Neither girl puts up a fight. They would soon be questioned. And we now hear Morgan describing the victim, Peyton, as one of her closest friends. She was my best friend since fourth grade. Who was? Peyton. So why did you pick Peyton? I didn't pick her. And as Morgan is being questioned, that friend Peyton is coming out of surgery. And when that surgeon comes out, mm. what did he reveal? He said, so we had to crack her chest. It was awful to hear that she had to go through that. How close do you think she was to losing her? If the knife had gone uh, the width of a human hair further, she wouldn't have lived. A human hair. What is that, a millimeter? Less than a millimeter. Between living and dying? Yes. Where on earth do you think she got the strength to crawl out of those woods? Well, we asked her, and she said I wanted to live. At first, Peyton couldn't talk, writing to communicate. Do you remember the first message she wrote? I want to go home. I want to go home. When can I go home? And has Peyton talked at all about the horror of that moment? She told me she was scared. But the first time I asked her what she remembered about what happened, she said, all I remember is the pain. The pain. And they would reveal to me there was something else she asked. Did they get them? We told her they were, they were found and the police had them. And as a dad in that moment, how hard was that? Harder than I would have ever been able to imagine. This is my little girl who's laying there, and the only thing that I could tell her at the time to make her feel better was that the police have them and she was safe with us. His daughter terrified of the two girls who were her friends. How well did you know these these two other girls. They were, oh, they were best, they were best friends, friends since about fourth grade. Fourth grade is when we met Morgan for the first time. They say Peyton would talk to Morgan every night on the phone. Were there ever any red flags? They would have little arguments, but every 12-year-old girl has little arguments. The other 12-year-old, Anissa Wire, they had not met, but they say Peyton knew her from school. And as Joe and Stacy reassure their daughter that the girls had been found, police were questioning them. What did they do to their friend? And even more disturbing, why did they do it? Tonight, Morgan, for the first time in those interrogation tapes, seeming to waver. I didn't want to do this. What did you do with him? Because I didn't want him to be alone. Because I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't. And Anissa, also fearing what would happen if they didn't do it. I was really scared, knowing that Slytherin could easily kill my whole family in three seconds. And just listen to the detective who was questioning her. When Morgan said to you that if, if we don't do this for Slender, um, our families are and loved ones are going to be killed, do you honestly believe that? Well, yeah. Needless to say, rightly or wrongly, there was a great deal of interest in the attempted murder trial that followed the young girl's arrests and subsequent charges of attempted first-degree murder for Geyser and attempted second-degree murder for Weir. In fact, Weir's statements, both in police interviews and in the court, provided an insight into the whole harrowing affair. She offered that Slenderman was the leader of the creepypasta world and that killing showed dedication to him. She would also state that it was Geyser who had suggested killing their friend in order to make themselves proxies and prove their dedication to him. According to Weir, she and Geyser believed that Slender Man was real, and the killing of Leitner would prove this to people. They also believed that this mysterious, supernatural figure lived in the Nicolette National Forest in a strange mansion, a residence that they planned to visit immediately after the attack. The sickly affair began to unfold shortly after school on Friday. Weir and Geyser had gone straight to her home where Weir proceeded to pack a backpack with such things as granola bars and water, spare clothes, and pictures of her family, later stating that she wished to remember them after arriving at Slenderman's mansion. Following this, they made their way to Geyser's home, whose father would drive them to Leitner's home a short time later before taking all three of them to Skateland. They returned to Geyser's home at 9.30 p.m., 
with all three girls sleeping in Geyser's bedroom. We are further revealed that the original plan was to kill Leitner in her room at 2 a.m. by placing duct tape over her mouth and then stabbing her in the throat. They would then pull the covers over her as if she were sleeping before making their way to what they believed was Slender Man's mansion. However, at some point during the evening at the skate park, the plans changed. We are noticed that in the bathroom at a park nearby, there was a drain on the floor that would allow blood to drain away. They decided the following morning they would visit the park and commit the killing there. On the Saturday morning, the three girls made their way to the park. Weir would recall that before they left, Geyser flashed a look of the knife under her jacket to her. It was at this point that she began to feel a little uneasy with the fact that this was really happening. They did indeed find themselves in the bathroom, and according to Weir, there was an attempt made by Geyser to restrain Leitner, but she suffered a nervous breakdown and had to be calmed down by her friend. Despite this apparent attempt, Leitner remained with the girls, and they agreed to walk to the nearby woods and play hide-and-seek. Geyser would seek first, with the other two girls going to hide. This is where things began to escalate, eventually resulting in the frenzied attack. Weir suggested to Leitner that she hide on the ground, face down in the dirt. Leitner, however, refused to do so. At this point, Weir forced the victim to the ground and proceeded to sit on her to stop her from getting up. Geyser was nearby, and Weir expected her to come over and stab their friend. Leitner, though, began to shout, meaning that passers-by might arrive to see what the matter was. Weir got up from her back so she would become quiet. Geyser, according to Weir, passed the knife to her and indicated that she should stab the victim. Weir then claimed that she was too squeamish and immediately passed it back to Geyser. It was at this point the frenzied attack was launched. Ultimately, the two girls pleaded guilty and were given lengthy sentences. Weir, although sentenced to 25 years to life, only three of these had to be spent incarcerated in a mental health facility, followed by supervision until the age of 37. In the summer of 2021, she was released from the facility and then subjected to the public supervision order. Geyser was sentenced to 40 years to life and remains incarcerated at the time of this recording in a mental health facility. As we might imagine, there was much discussion and debate as to the influence of the Slender Man. Not only Weir and Geyser, but society, particularly the young as a whole. And this debate was not limited to the state of Wisconsin but led to a wider nationwide debate. One result of these debates was the blocking of Creepypasta Wiki in the Waukesha School District. The administrators of the website responded that the attack in the district was an isolated incident, although, as we will examine shortly, this would prove not to be the case, although through no fault of their own, and that the website was a literary website, not one that promoted nor condoned murder. Eric Knudsen, Slender Man's original creator, would state that he was deeply saddened by the attack. As the discussions on the case and connection to the internet character of the Slender Man went on, the debate began to shift to the overall effect of the internet in general. It's easy to see how a knee-jerk reaction might have happened. However, while there were plenty of recommendations to parents regarding what their children might view on the internet, it was argued that such influence as had seemingly happened in the Slender Man stabbings, could just as easily have come from horror novels about all manner of scary creatures. At this point, it's perhaps worth pausing for a moment and examining just how real a legend such as the Slender Man, who we know was created for the purpose of an internet forum, can actually be. We'll try to answer that question up next on Weird Darkness. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. 
Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. How real can an imaginary figure be? We might state, for example, that in the minds of the two girls who carried out the attack in Wisconsin, Slender Man was very real. And what's more, they were seeking not only the approval of the Slender Man, but were looking to prove to the world his authenticity. Perhaps the fact that they carried out such a vicious attack did, in a roundabout way, bring the Slender Man to life, making him a reality to all of us. Slender Man, a faceless ghoul. HBO's Beware the Slender Man, taking an in depth look at the 2014 so called Slender Man inspired attack. This isn't a whodunit. We know they did it. It's really a how done it. It's a why done it. Officials say Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire, at the time just 12 years old, lured their friend Peyton Lutner into the woods in Wisconsin, stabbing her 19 times with a kitchen knife. Though left for dead, 12 year old Peyton crawled to a nearby bike path where a passerby called for help. Is there any bleeding going on? Her clothing has got blood on it. The girls later saying they'd attacked their friend to please the fictional internet character Slender Man. I was really scared knowing that Slender could easily kill my whole family in three seconds. In the documentary, Anissa's parents speaking out, saying their daughter spent a lot of time on the internet, adding while they'd been aware of Slender Man, they had no clue their daughter thought he was real. Now, each of the girls has pleaded not guilty by reason of mental defect or disease. They face up to 65 years in prison if convicted. The victim's family wouldn't comment on the documentary, but say they, quote, fully support the efforts of the district attorney's office and that their priority is making sure their daughter can move on with her life. Amy. All right, Mara, thank you. And the parents of Anissa Wire, Bill and Christy, join us now. Thank you for being with us. And Bill, I want to begin with you because I want to ask, what was that moment like when you found out what had happened and your daughter's involvement in it um, it was it was really kind of surreal from the time I got the phone call to the time that we realized there were more things going on than what we were initially led to believe um, it, it's it's yeah I think surreal is the best way to describe it because you try to struggle with how are you processing what you're finding out about what your child is capable of being suspected of Right. And Christy, I know that when you when you watch the interrogation videos, both your daughter and the other young girl seem to believe that Slender Man is real, that it that there was no difference between fact and fiction for them. At during the the interview tapes that we've seen, um, they thoroughly believed that Slender Man was real and they wanted to prove that he was real and and you had no indication of this at home that this was like something that she was obsessed with or no. couldn't stop you know, watching. We've never seen her watch videos or read stories or hey, look what I found on the internet or anything. She was just typical. She was a compared typical twelve-year-old at that well, point. You didn't think she had any compared of these to the other three children. She didn't show any other signs of. Dis disbeliefs right. or anything. No, no suspension from reality. Your daughter's 15 now. Yes. Has she expressed remorse? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that you all have never spoken to Peyton and her family yet. Is there anything that you'd like to say to them now? If they were here face to face, you know, I would tell them I'm sorry. I tell them that I'm thankful that Peyton survived. And I would tell them that for as much as they are struggling with trying to process this and what happened to their daughter, we are struggling equally trying to process this with what happened not only to their daughter but to our daughter. Sadly, the case in Waukesha is not the only one where the Slender Man has been connected to grim and potentially deadly events. 
In June 2014, only weeks after the attack on Waukesha, a 13-year-old girl who was said to have had an obsession with the Slender Man attacked her mother with a knife in Hamilton County, Ohio. Fortunately, the victim survived to speak of the attack, which she blamed on her daughter's mental health issues. She would state that she'd arrived home on the night in question and found her daughter waiting for her in the kitchen wearing a white mask. She would continue that her daughter had written about demons and insanity, as well as several references to Slenderman. Around the same time, in Las Vegas, Nevada, a man was accused of killing a member of the public and two police officers before committing suicide with his wife that was connected to the Slender Man legend. According to a neighbor, the gunman had an obsession with the Slender Man and would often dress up in costume as the spooky figure. Only months later, in September 2014, a 14-year-old girl would set her family home on fire in Port Ritchie in Florida, allegedly inspired to do so by the Slender Man. According to the police report, the teenager fled the premises as the flames took hold and spent the night in a bathroom in a nearby park where she was arrested. Although the home was entirely destroyed, all inside made it out alive. The teenager had an apparent obsession with the Slender Man, as police discovered from her internet history, as well as her own admission that she had been reading a lot about him online. Whether the Slender Man did, if only in her own mind, inspire the young girl to set fire at the house, the police certainly believed that there was a connection. There has also been a spate of suicides that the Slender Man legend has been connected to that took place in between the end of 2014 and the early summer of 2015 at a Pine Ridge Reservation at Oglala Lakota Reservation in South Dakota. The New York Times would report that there had been in excess of 100 suicides in the six months leading up to their report in May 2015, and that several officials with knowledge of the cases said that at least one of the youths who committed suicide was influenced to do so by Slender Man. What is particularly interesting about these unfortunate events is that there is a local belief in a suicide spirit whose various names elude very much to the Slender Man. The spirit was known by several names, including the Tall Man, the Big Man, or Walking Sam, and would encourage its unfortunate victims to commit suicide. Were these apparently Slender Man-influenced suicides unique to the youth of Pine Ridge Reservation, perhaps because of the local folklore of the Tall Man or Walking Sam? It is perhaps intriguing in itself that such legends that are very similar to the fictional legend of the Slender Man existed before his creation, if we assume that Slender Man's creator had no knowledge of them. There was also an account of a potential mass suicide that almost took place on the reservation when multiple teenagers ventured into nearby woodland. The aim was simple – to hang themselves from the trees at the same time. According to the report, a local pastor named John Two Bulls got wind of the tragic incident about to unfold and managed to make his way to the location and bring proceedings to a halt. Talk among many of the reservation community believed the teenagers had been led there by Walking Sam. Whether such an effect of the Slender Man has occurred in other suicides around the world in the decade or so since its creation is unknown. However, it's clear that this fictional character has had very real influence in the lives of other people around the world. We could do worse than turn to the research files of Nick Redfern and an account he relays of a trainee flight attendant from Erie, Pennsylvania, who claimed to the researcher that she had several encounters with the Slender Man beginning in 2016. She would claim that these encounters began shortly after she read the book by Robin Swope, Slender Man, From Fiction to Fact. What is also of interest is that, by her own admission, she quickly became obsessed with the mysterious and very fictional figure after reading the book. As Redfern writes, Lacey didn't see the Slender Man in the flesh in 3D physical form. She did, though, encounter him on her laptop. One evening in the summer of 2016, her laptop was beside her in sleep mode while Lacey was watching television. Suddenly, however, the laptop came to life seemingly of its own accord. Even stranger and more unnerving, for the briefest of moments, Lacey could see what appeared to be the strange image that was somewhere between a man and a long-legged bug. 
She tried to push the incident from her mind, telling herself that the image had been a trick of the lights and shadows in the room. However, two nights later, a very similar incident took place, and she knew that something rather extraordinary was taking place. On this second occasion, as her laptop suddenly came to life again, another image quickly presented itself. However, rather than being a bony, tall body, it was a clear depiction of the slender man's face. Or perhaps a more accurate description would be a lack of it, as the eyes, the nose, and the ears were all missing, just as the legend states is the case. Lacey was immediately terrified by the events and raced out of her apartment, making her way to her mother's house where she would spend the night. Several weeks passed with no further incidents, and Lacey began to put the episodes from her mind. However, late one evening, around 11 p.m. while she was wrapping presents on the floor of her living room, her laptop suddenly came to life once more. This time, though, rather than see a strange figure or a blank, featureless face, a quiet, deep voice spoke to her, stating, "'We are friends,' before the laptop returned to its sleep mode, as if nothing happened." This time, Lacey was almost beside herself with terror and made a conscious decision to cease all of her reading and research into the Slender Man. Such was her terror that she even deleted all of her research files and even went as far as burning the aforementioned book in a metal bin in the yard of her mother's house. Following this, the strange visits suddenly stopped. According to what Lacey told Nick Redfern, it was her belief that her intense research into the subject of the Slender Man had caused the internet itself to realize it and so presented her with the Slender Man himself. This might sound a little outrageous, but we will return to this notion very shortly. Is it possible that Slender Man has connections to another mysterious figure from the 1830s? We'll look at Slender Man's tie to Spring-Heeled Jack when Weird Darkness returns. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. it might be worth our time straying slightly into the sightings of Spring-Heeled Jack from the 1830s to the very early years of the 20th century, although these later sightings were much fewer and more spread apart. There have been many suggestions put forward for who or what might be responsible for Spring-Heeled Jack, ranging from a deranged maniac to a supernatural entity or possibly even an alien being. However, to some researchers, admittedly more from the mainstream, it's clear that the initial Spring-Heeled Jack sightings were the work of one person who was then copied throughout the years, which would explain the sightings in different parts of the UK and decades later. If this was the case, does that make Spring-Heeled Jack a Victorian version of the Slender Man, using real sightings and largely nonviolent attacks which are then reported in the newspapers and so contribute to the ever-growing legend of this mysterious menace on the streets of London and further afield? And even if a small number of the reports were leaning more to the fictitious, they still achieved their aim of adding another layer of intrigue to the legend. Indeed, 
might we see Slender Man take on a more physical role in the real world over the coming years, albeit one that would seemingly be one that is much more horrific than the largely mischievous nature of Spring-Heeled Jack? It's interesting that in the days leading to the author writing the article I'm narrating for you here, he spoke with his son, who is about 20 years old now, about the Slender Man. What was interesting is how his son stated matter-of-factly, as if he were referring to a nursery rhyme, that, quote, anyone of his age knows who Slender Man is, unquote, and what's more, they have known about him for as long as they can remember, even though they are perfectly aware that he is just a myth and recently created legend. In this sense, to anyone born after 2000, the Slender Man is simply an accepted part of imaginary life and takes a place in the same realm as the Boogeyman might have for previous generations. This shows the sheer power and reach of the Slender Man legend, and perhaps also demonstrates the delivery method, in this case the internet, and how effective a tool for information sharing it truly is. We are seeing the creation, development, and growth of an urban legend, modern-day folklore, in real time. And it is for this reason that many who study myths, legends, and folklore, both from a research perspective or a scholarly level, are so fascinated, as it perhaps gives us a window into how such legends and myths of the past were formed and what truths might be within them. In this case, we know that from a completely fictional character, a real version sprang, if only in the minds of the two young girls who attempted to then murder their friend in this imaginary menace's name. Once more, for those involved, including the victim, the Slender Man was suddenly very real, as were the consequences of the actions he influenced. When we consider the suicides mentioned before, if we assume the connections made are correct, then we might state that for these tragic people who felt their only option was to take their own life, the Slender Man was also very real. These real events have, over time, become intertwined with the legend of the Slender Man. For example, some legends speak of him convincing people to take their own lives. In this sense, the fictional Slender Man feeds the real Slender Man, and vice versa. There is a saying that perception is reality. If someone thinks something, then unless they somehow change their perspective, it might as well be as they think it is. This is perhaps the same for those who, for whatever reason, perceive the Slender Man as very real. This idea of perception being reality, if in a twisted and skewered type of way, is perhaps worth staying with a little longer. In the movie Shadow People, for example, the idea is floated toward the end of the film that just knowing and then consequently believing in the menacing shadowy entities was enough for them to appear and wreak havoc almost as if they were only real in the minds of those who were aware of them. And while this stopped short of saying, in the film, that shadow people were completely imaginary, it was an intriguing twist and notion. Might much the same be said for the Slender Man for similar reasons. That somewhere in the human psyche there is a contemplation of his authenticity, even if the person is not aware of it. Why then do the Slender Man legends in particular appear rife for this conversation from fictional creature to a perceived real entity? And why does this not happen with other manufactured horror characters from the movies, such as Freddy Krueger, for example? It is perhaps interesting to note that some legends, such as Dracula and vampires in general, have been acted out in the real world with many people committing murder in the belief that they themselves are vampires. Perhaps, subconsciously, the human mind rejects the movie horror figures and contemplates those of legend and folklore, simply because a tiny part of them can't be 100% certain that they are entirely fictitious. It's also interesting to highlight the words of researcher and writer Miguel Romero, also known as Red Pill Junkie, who would comment on the reality of the Slender Man in the modern world as being a cultural remix between the older myth of the tall man suicide spirit, which already existed among Native Americans prior to the rise of the World Wide Web, and the newer, more potent icon of Slender Man, which had found its way into the reservation as it had in many other homes around America and indeed the world. And while Romero is certainly not saying the Slender Man is real in the conventional sense of the word, 
He certainly appears real enough to have a drastic effect on the minds of various young people. There is, though, another possibility, however unlikely, that we should consider, and it is to that train of thought where we will turn our attention next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Although this is rampant speculation, and certainly not meant in a disrespectful way, it is still perhaps worth considering such ideas as the psychic internet theory put forward by researcher and author Peter McHugh. At its most basic, the psychic internet theory suggests that each human mind subconsciously has the ability to connect to others, much like computers connected via the internet. And what's more, the power of these collective and connected minds can manifest what they are subconsciously tapped into in reality. For example, if a group of people with an interest in UFOs all descend upon a UFO hotspot, they might very much be expecting to see a UFO, even if these expectations are subconscious. This potential concentration of subconscious mental energy might very well result in the said UFO appearing, like a collective hallucination, but real at the same time. Admittedly, these ideas are speculative and bordering on outlandish, but also make a certain amount of sense given how little we know of the human mind. And then, if we bring in legends from the ancient world, in this case that of Ptah, one of the creator gods of ancient Egypt, they become even more intriguing. It is said that Ptah sat upon a winged chair and was able to bring his thoughts literally to life so much so that he essentially imagined the world into existence. As unlikely as it might be, although we should remind ourselves that the ancient Egyptians themselves declared such writings as fact and not legends or myths, if there was any truth to legends of Ptah, might we all, or at least our subconscious minds, have the ability to manifest our thoughts into reality? At this point, it's worth our time reminding ourselves of the account of Lacey, as relayed by researcher Nick Redfern. It was her belief that her own interest in research had resulted in the appearance of the Slender Man on her laptop. We might also consider the claims of such alleged advanced technology that cause hallucinations in masses of people, as well as the alleged experiments of intelligence agencies of a person manifesting objects into reality from the power of their mind alone. As the legend of the Slender Man grew and circulated around the internet, might it be possible, however unlikely, that the collective subconscious of the human mind then brought it to life and imagined it into reality? If a group of people, in this case connected together by the internet itself, began to imagine seeing the Slender Man for real through internet forums and message boards, even if they were not aware of it, might the power of their subconscious mind have manifested this entity into existence. It is perhaps comforting to us that such notions are unlikely for 
If there were any truths to them, it would mean not only altering our perceptions, but the need to confront a terror that we couldn't, or in this case, could imagine. As we can see then, the Slender Man could be argued to be both entirely fictional and very real at the same time, at least from certain perspectives. If, for example, the two 12-year-old girls in Waukesha had not believed in the reality of Slender Man, they would surely have not attempted to murder their friend in order to appease him. Much could be said of the other attacks by youngsters that followed. Was this some kind of mass hysteria, or did the Slender Man slip into the perceived realities of many young minds around the same time and so, ultimately, bring him to life through their actions? And we might also consider the suicides of the Pine Ridge Reservation. While we might argue that each person who tragically took their own life must have had their own personal demons working against them, if they also bought into or believed the legends of Slender Man enough, which, remember, were almost becoming intertwined with ancient legends of the suicide spirit, then to them this dark character suddenly becomes very real. Here's more from that ABC News report. Breaking news, a 12-year-old girl is stabbed. The girl was lured to the area by two of her classmates who allegedly stabbed her 19 times. The girls had hoped the attack would earn them a home in Slender Man's mansion. Slender Man is a fictional horror character. We have been there for the journey. Two different mothers now visiting their daughters, locked up since they were 12. We try to visit at least once a week. On a good week, I can get up there two or three times. Anissa was actually sent to the Washington County Juvenile Detention Facility. Christy Wire, her daughter, is Anissa. Most children are only up there for an average of four months, and she's been there almost three years. Angie Geyser's daughter, Morgan, who came up with the plan and who held the knife. The children have no access to the outdoors or even windows to look out of. In the last 35 months, Anissa's maybe had 40 hours of fresh air. And there is no physical contact. I can't wipe away a tear. I can't give her a hug. I can't kiss her. Their daughters are now teenagers. They have spent countless hours driving to visit their daughters locked up, trying to wrap their heads around how their two little girls, just 12 years old at the time, could have done something so unimaginable. And all of it began that Friday night. What was the plan for that night? On Friday nights, Skateland had um, free pizza. So the girls went a little early and ate dinner and skated. And the third girl who was with them, Peyton Leitner, also just 12. Stacy and Joe Leitner remember their daughter had been looking forward to it for weeks. You remember how excited she was that Friday afternoon. Oh my gosh, she was so, so excited. Do you think Peyton had any idea? No. She had absolutely no idea. She was blindsided. Blindsided by what those two friends had in store. And they'd been planning it for months. After that night of skating, they would return to Morgan's house. Morgan's mother, Angie, downstairs. They played up in Morgan's bedroom with Morgan's dolls. I mean, it was just a normal night. And no sign that two were plotting against Peyton? No, no sign whatsoever. The next morning, Morgan asked if they could go to the park. How often would they go to the park? Well, we were actually, believe it or not, pretty strict parents and didn't let Morgan um, go out on her own very often. But you thought because she had her two friends, it would be safe? Mm -hmm. The first sign anything is wrong, a police officer showing up at Angie's door. And my heart dropped down into my stomach. Not only were there police in my living room, but they were um, wearing riot gear. Across town, officers are also arriving at Peyton's house. Around the side of the house, up over the deck, came a uniformed officer. The first thing that goes through my mind is, something has happened to somebody that I love. And they asked me, where's Morgan? I said, she's at the park with her friends. Angie Geyser says the police tell her that Morgan is missing. They think she may be hiding her daughter. They searched the house and I just kept asking, you know, what happened, what's going on? And they, they wouldn't tell me other than to say there had been an incident at the park. 
and one of the girls was hurt. At first, police refusing to reveal which one of those girls was hurt. They quickly also tracked down the parents of the third friend, Anissa Wire, telling them their daughter is missing too. My thought was child abduction. Where's my daughter? That's the only thought I had in my head. It would take hours to piece together exactly what happened at that birthday sleepover. The first moment anyone would begin to learn of the horror is this call to 911. 911, I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend. 12-year-old Peyton Leitner had just crawled out of the woods, covered in blood, stabbed 19 times. And you can hear it in their voices. The operators cannot believe what they are hearing. He came upon a 12-year-old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Correct. Greg Steinberg was riding his bike that morning on a path that had actually been chained off. It was pure chance he came this way. And you were biking by and she says to you what? Could you help me please? I've been stabbed multiple times. I quick got out my cell phone, I was shaken. He watches as the ambulance rushes her away. And when you looked at her, it was immediately apparent she'd been stabbed multiple times. Yeah, to her chest and abdomen and arm and leg. Doctors fear she might not survive. And her mother, Stacy, has just been told that Peyton has been rushed to the hospital. She was terrified. She was crying. She couldn't breathe. But she saw you there. She saw me, and she put her hand out. And I rushed over to her, and I put my arms around her, and I laid next to her, and I hugged her. And I said, you're going to be OK. It's going to be fine. But I could see that she was covered. Her arms and her legs and her abdomen they were covered in stab wounds. There were so many stab wounds, it took two nurses to count them, 19 in all. And her little girl is now being raced down the hall. Did you say anything to Peyton as they were wheeling her away? That I loved her and that she would be okay. Peyton's mother could not believe that her daughter's friend could be capable of this. Morgan didn't do this is what's going through my head. There's no way. There's no way that's, that's what happened. Morgan is 12. Morgan has never heard a fly. It was just unthinkable that Morgan would, would do anything to hurt someone else. But that's exactly what investigators were telling Morgan's mother, that her daughter and Anissa Wire had stabbed their friend multiple times, and now both girls were nowhere to be found. They had run away, and the police hadn't found them yet. They were going to find a mansion in the woods. Oh, the mansion, yeah, the mansion in the woods. They were going to the Nicolay Forest because they believed that there was a mansion there that Slenderman lived in. For those who have to deal with such attacks and suicides, with a connection to the Slenderman, the consequences of that respective and at times collective belief are also very real and very tragic. Without a doubt, though, from a research point of view, from various perspectives, disciplines, and fields of interest, the Slenderman legends and how they have unfolded have been a chance to watch the development and evolution of modern folklore in real time. As it happens, as opposed to observing a fully formed legend from thousands of years ago, the opportunity to do this offers potential insight into many such legends and folklore of yesteryear. Where the Slender Man legend may go from here, if it grows in stature or declines in interest remains to be seen. It will remain, though, one of the most intriguing, unsettling, and unique legends in history. Of that, there is little doubt. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the email newsletter to win monthly prizes, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, suicide, or other dark thoughts. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Slender Man, Blurring the Lines of Reality was written by Marcus Louth for UFOinsight.com. 
Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And a final thought. You don't have a soul. You have a body. You are a soul. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.